and uh, you're listening to Corey Radio here. We're coming to you live and deadly. We're going to catch up now with Michael Anderson from the Sovereign Unit of uh, First Peoples and uh, also to um, Peoples in Australia. And uh, just uh, reflecting back uh, last year, he um, cruised around the country, especially over in WA, but uh, also too, to remind people out there that uh, about what the uh, Whitlam uh, Labor government did uh, did uh, back in the 70s to establish the Australian Law Reform Commission and give it terms of reference, which were to investigate and uh, recommend the recognition and inclusion of First Nation customary law within the Australian legal system and practice. There have been magistrates, as I know, in the Northern Territory that uh, have also um, had agreed that they should have customary law within the uh, within the Western system as well, because a lot of our people do still live in their communities and still live by their law practices, which is uh, very different to, to Western law. So also, too, that two-way law, that sometimes when you get convicted and go into jail in the Northern Territory or in remote communities, when you come up, you still have to uh, um, accept, uh, well, yeah, judgment from customs. to the program again. Yeah, good to be back with you. Yeah, good to be black with you, too. <laughs> no, it's just, uh, it's just <laughs> good to be black. It's good to be black. Now, I noticed when you travelled around over in Western Australia last year, and you have been travelling around the country talking to uh, um, different uh, mobs and getting their concerns um, out there. And this was, um, you were in WA last uh, year at uh, meetings over there, but um, nothing seems to be moving in WA with um, all the, I suppose, with all the recommendations and the understanding of what the Australian government uh, was prepared to do, but haven't done since. Well, the, the government hasn't done anything, but the people are themselves making moves, yeah? And, um, and, they're, yep. and they're quite significant moves. Like we've set up uh, in the Pilbara region and the Great Sandy Desert region, the Mardu people, uh, we have set up now the Wadi Law Council, um, which is a very, will become a very powerful institution. Um, wow. and, um, and the position basically is now, they're, they're in the process now of sort of beginning to assert all their dominant rights um, under their law and culture. And, um, the, you know, the second phase to that now is to secure the, the Women's Council um, of Elders yep. and uh, senior law people. And uh, they've already made moves. They've got senior women there and um, uh, who... Um, primarily sort of operate from the Seven Sisters story um, because that's one yep. of the main ones that crisscrosses this country throughout Australia and um, and connects, you know, women law. And so we, um, yeah, there's a, there's a significant uh, number of um, things that are, that are taking place. I'm, my next uh, uh, discussions will be working with the, um, at, the requ at their invitation, uh, the women of Nukumbar. And um, we all know Nunkamba from the 70s, uh, late 70s. Um, and in fact, Nunkamba was the first time uh, that the Aboriginal people got to present to the United Nations through a bloke called Reg Birch from the NAC, who went to the United Nations in 1979 um, to argue the case at the Human Rights Council there about the uh, forced... Um, uh, military invasion of Nunkamba people when they got the military and the police to escort the mining drilling rigs over there to look for oil in their country. Mm. Yeah, I remember that. There was a, um, several songs and uh, that that came out from that Nunkamba strike as well. A absolutely, and 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 they they blocked yeah. the roads and then they bought you know. And ironically enough, you know, when you look at the old uh, films from that, uh, for those who recorded some of it. You see it was led by the military. There was a military force in front of yep. them. Then there was the police. And then there was the security and the um, uh, private security of the mining trucks, uh, drilling rigs, uh, coming onto Nukumba land, onto the people's land. So so I've, um, yeah, the old women uh, now, senior law people, have asked me to get involved with them to uh, take up the issue uh, from a sovereign perspective. From a sovereign, yeah, from a sovereign perspective. Yes. I mean, there's still we've got Victoria and that's still talking about treaty and a voice to uh, Parliament, but it's under the Westminster system. Yeah. I don't know. I get really I get really confused when I'm trying to read all that stuff, and it's like, well, no, it might possibly be because of the way the laws have been written under the Westminster system, and it's not really giving hope, or we're not getting an understanding from either side. What is it? What does it really mean? 
Well, I keep telling people that, um, look, you know, the, the treaties are about, um, you know, having having a bit of uh, flesh in in both camps, and that is, uh, at present, the the you know the the Victorian government, um, they're they're only permitted to negotiate deals that are permissible under their constitution, so the state of Victorian constitution. But still, in all, the uh, the sovereign of the sovereignty of that state is held by the British Crown, and so what yeah. you, what they have to do before they even start any negotiations is find out what the British Crown is prepared to give up, um, because you know otherwise it's it's useless if the Crown is going to maintain ownership of everything, and you're only you're only going to be dealing with the crumbs that fall from the table. Well, that's not an equal negotiating um, arrangement, and there's no there's no parity there. And so, why in the world would the Aboriginal people in Victoria want to enter into um, an agreement when, in fact, all they're do going to be doing is about houses, about a state, maybe some compensation, maybe some um, maybe a little bit of land here and there. Uh, but they're getting that in native title anyway. They got a Victorian land trust that looks after those old former reserves. I understand um, they they're doing it. So what what are they what are they really giving them? Um, and and this is what the people, yeah. you know, I, I I think it would be beneficial for all Aboriginal people to understand uh, the Victorian Aboriginal perspective and let that be published so that we can you know people can see it around the country, because I can tell you that what the governments in this country agree to with the Victorians, no other government is going to go beyond that. There's no way in the world. So the Victorian Aboriginal people and their nations have to understand that they're going to have a significant impact on the rights that, have, that uh, will be laid down for other Aboriginal people right across this country, and I don't think they understand that. Also, too, if we're not in the Constitution, shouldn't we, we be looking at going to the British Crown, going to the Queen, and, and uh, ask, you know, taking them to, to task? Well, th this, is, this is exactly... Rather than the Australian government? Yes. This is exactly my point. Um, the, the Queen keeps saying that, um, in a lot of correspondence I've had direct with her, um, that, um, you know, her representatives in the Australian colonies is the Governor-General and, the, um, and yeah. the governors of the states. So what we've got to do is we've got to have entering discussions directly with those governors and that Governor-General in respect to taking matters forward about, well, OK, here's what we want from the Crown. So it's no good of asking us, asking um, them what they're prepared to give up. We've got to tell them what we want them to give up, yeah? And this is where our people have not had sufficient time to talk about this. And, yep. and you know, yep, they're behind the eight ball yep. before they even bloody start. So it's absurd to the, the way things are going right now. You there, Lola? Hello? Yeah, no, I just, what I might do, what I might do, I might just ring you back. We're just having a bit of a problem with the line there, so just hang in there and I'll just bring you back, okay? Right on, mate. I'll just put a little bit of, I'll just put a little bit of music on here. Right on. Lola Forrester. Got you. Yeah, we've got him on, right. got him on the line there. How are you there? Good. You that, there, Michael? Yeah, that's better. Yep, can you hear me? That is a bit, yeah, that is. Yeah, I can hear you now. I can hear you now. No, because it's really interesting because it's really confusing because we've got uh, Megan uh, Davis and uh, George uh, Williams. Is it George yet? George Williams? Yeah, George Williams. Um, of have written a, written a book. Yeah, written yeah, everything you need to know about the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Megan Davis and George Williams, yeah. Yeah. They've uh, written a book there. Have you seen that at all? No, I've not seen it, no. Yeah, no, well, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't got a hold of it neither, but... Uh, it's even just to start with Uluru is not the correct and that's um you know breaching protocol when we talk about the statement from the heart there so even that in itself is um, being disrespectful to the Anagu people you know of um what of them ap1 you know ap1 people up there but getting back to uh this about the queen and, it's, and the governor general as a representative and the, the state govern governors why hasn't anybody done that well, have you done that? yes, I have. What we've done is that we've we've written to the Queen and um, we've set out a whole number of things around our sovereign rights, and um, and we even we've even done a treaty with uh, with the Queen, 
um, direct uh, her as the Crown, and the treaty is all about what's already been agreed to by the Crown. Yeah, and what we've said is that yes, yeah. we accept those offerings, and um, and uh, those offerings are you know are expressed in court decisions. They're expressed in instructions from the gov uh, from um, the British Crown when they was colonising. Um, not only that, we also have the statement by King William the Fourth when he uh, in um, 1824. 25, um, when he presented to the Parliament what was going wrong in the colonies, you know. So, yeah. so we did a treaty saying yes, we agree with all this and we accept these offerings, and that and and so by my elders and our executive council signing that treaty, uh, the terms of that, what we've done is that we've basic we've 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 done completed a treaty. Now we got to get back to them and saying, okay, this is what we want as a comprehensive settlement. So it's 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 the, these fellows here are negotiating with the wrong mob. So that's just with your nation. Yes. That's just your nation there. But um, why haven't other people picked up? Because we have been travelling around talking about it. Why haven't other people got that understanding that they could do the same thing? Well, there are people now. That's why I'm being contacted from people all around the country asking me to work with them to uh, show them how to do it. It's an expression of uh, their own sovereign interests and their sovereign rights, sovereign inherent rights. And we're, you know, I'm working with a group of people now where uh, an application will be lodged before the federal court to overturn a native title decision and go to common law. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. That's what I was trying to work out. When is it going to um, take this case to the court in regards to native title, which is uh, giving our people false uh, pretenses that they own their land, but not realising they can be taken away from them just as much as being given to them? That's right. And anyway, we're about to... Um, we're, we're in the process now. I'm sort of finalising some yeah. advisory information um, in regards to that, and um, we hope that that will be lodged by July or August um, the latest. In the federal court, in, uh, July, in yeah. it'll it we we hope to have it uh, completed and and uh, lodged in the in the federal court before um, August. And is that just your nation? No, 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 no. That's um, that's another mob in Western Australia. I won't name them yet. That's that's it. That's that's fine. That's a WA mob. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, but that's it's fine, it, but we need, yeah, yeah. Well, it'll it'll become Marbo Mark Three. Marbo Mark III. Or, like Mar or Marbo Mark II, I think. Ma we haven't had a Marbo decision in relation to um, uh, to, uh, New S uh, to the mainland of Australia. But I, rec yeah. I recommend to every black fella out there uh, that's listening to your program to have a look at a, a, a full bench of the High Court when they made a decision in the case called West Australia versus the Commonwealth 1995, so three years after Marbo. Uh, I can't vaguely, yeah. Now, I'm telling you, I'm telling you and your listeners that if you, you, yeah. you just, you can, you can be, you don't have to be a lawyer or a, some sort of constitutional yeah. legal expert to understand what is said in that judgment. And I'm telling you, Native title um, has been um, a it's it's a sham, and when yep. you when you look at that that decision in the West Australian case that I'm saying three years after Marbo, they said in there that section two two three of the Native Title Act that says about extinguishment and all that Aboriginal lands. Yep. And all the colonisation of Australia and the, the expression of sovereignty by the Crown at the time of colonisation in Western Australia. So they're saying that if it didn't happen in Western Australia, well, it didn't happen in any other colonies either. And they're saying that no, no Aboriginal rights to, to their lands were ever extinguished. Wow. That's a full bench of the High Court on the mainland. So no Aboriginal rights would extinguish, you said. No, no, no crown, um, no actions, oh, no, crown, sorry, no actions of the yeah. crown. From the time they asserted sovereignty by establishing colonies in the states around this nation, yep. 
did not intend to extinguish any rights, proprietary rights in the land of the Aboriginal people. Yep, yes, I remember. Now, also true at that same time that John Howard was in 1996 and then he brought in the, the I call it the Ten Commandments, the, the Ten Point Plan. Yeah. The, <laughs> which even made it even more, more confusing. Yeah, but I'm telling uh -huh. you, I'm telling you this, yeah. I'm so, what I'm saying to you, you can you yes. can you can put the Ma Native Title Act in the garbage, because yes, exactly. nothing nothing the Native Title Act um, all subsequent acts and acts after colonisation have to be dealt with on an individual basis because none of our rights were ever extinguished by colonisation. Is that does that work in the same way when we're talking about um, a lodial title? Yes. The same thing? Yes, it is. It's that's the same bloody talking, thing. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, a lodial title. A lodial title is that you own everything from the, from the outer space to the centre of the earth, okay? Yeah. Now, if you, yeah. now, here, listen. In the Native Title Act, if you read the Native Title Act, you will find in the definitions there what, um, what rights are. And of course, all those things, it's written in the Native Title Act that we own the airspace above our lands and waters. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So That's true. those aeroplanes that are flying across our country should be paying to fly across oh, those, to that land. That country. Yes. Mm, that's yeah. e that's even. That's all the mining. Yeah, that's written in the Native Title Act. And the other thing is, Marbo said that the Crown did not get a beneficial title, and in brackets, a low deal. So yep. if they didn't get that, what the hell are they giving out land titles for, changing land titles and granting mining tenements? Hello, somebody is wrong, somebody's missing. And the people who are missing in action are the bloody lawyers who are not, don't understand it and are not fighting those matters. And that's really interesting because I've talked to lawyers, you know, and they go, oh, no, it's not going to... And I say, excuse me, but don't you read? And is it, is it because they're under the Westminster system? They're, or is it no, they're obliged to the, to the bar and they're obliged to the, yeah, they're they're obliged to the court, yeah? And so they're sworn, yeah. they're sworn agents of the court. So they represent the court and they have to make sure that the court, the way it operates... Um, that they advise their people whether they've got a chance of winning cases based on precedent and based on the written law. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, now it's the written crazy. yeah the written law, of course, is written by the by the uh, dominant military occupiers of this land, and they appoint the judges to keep those things in order. So, the lawyers they train is they're trained to think like them. They're trained to obey those rules, right? So you think outside of the court. That's why it's, you know, it's a brave one who takes on any test case to challenge the system. No, I, I believe that. Look, thanks for that. Thanks for that, Michael. And just hopefully that people will get online and start reading instead of listening to what other people are saying. Yeah. I mean, what we're saying here. But go and read for yourself, or if you can't read, get somebody to read it for you. And... Be really aware of what's really happening and what they're doing to us. I mean, I look at you know you, you know the um, on Fox and I see gold hunters. Yeah. You know, and they're out on country, and then there's opal miners. Yep. But whose country are they on? They're on our country. Whose country are they? Yeah, that's right. But they never show you that. They never on the television. They never show you it. This, this big country, that, but they don't show you where they are, and that makes me wonder. Um, you know, whose country, First Nations country that is, and that they're taking, well, they're stealing from First People. Yeah, well, most of, most of that gold stuff um, is Western Australia. Most of the, um, uh, there's one that's uh, down in Victoria around Ballarat and those areas where they're finding, yeah. where they found all them nuggets all those years ago. Um, that's where they are. Yeah. Um, the Opal one is at Lightning Ridge on my my people's country, and out at um, out here at um, they're up at up there in um, um, the mob. What do you call them? Up, up around Winton and all that area, Kainuna, with the um, yep. you know with that um, Opal up there, and then you got the other areas. They are they're out of Wankamura country on Barkindji land as well. That um, you know out here at White Cliffs and so on, and of course they're over there on um, at Cooper Pedy. Yeah. Isn't it interesting, but they're not telling you where it is? No, no, that's right. 
No. And they don't... It makes me wonder. <laughs> no. It actually makes me wonder. They know that they're not... They, that the possibilities are they know something more than um, they're letting on. Yeah, well, they're, they're only doing what the government are letting them, you know, and that's it. That's Done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, Michael, look, thanks. I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, get people to get a clear understanding of um, what they should be doing and looking up rather than, you know, yeah, I'm interviewing you, I'm interviewing other people, but read yourself of um, what it says in the in the legislation there and uh, you'll, you'll fully understand. But so, you, uh, the other thing, too, is the... Um, when it comes yep. to extinguishment of Aboriginal native title, right, um, under Section yep. 8A of, the Austra of that Constitution, right, Native Title Act, right, under the Native Title Act, Section 8A, yep. um, they, they, you'll see there where they refer to um, uh, the Criminal Code um, of Australia, yep. and um, you'll find that the lawyers and the people who are working in Aboriginal organisations within the native title, um, uh, in relation to the extinguishment of Aboriginal land, they are not to be, they cannot be prosecuted for any wrongdoings or wrong advice. Wow. They're exempt Look, from, Michael, they're exempt from prosecution. Now, it's just amazing how it's all been flipped around and, um, it's taken this long, yeah. and hopefully people um, people will get it, and uh, hopefully our people um, will get it, and our people that have gone on to be lawyers and all that, and academics when they're writing things out there, but not um, talking about a lodial title and our rights as First Nation people. But Michael, look, thank you very much for coming on the program again, keeping us updated um, in regards to this, and down the track, yeah, WA will be will be listening out. That's the state that. Our people should be really wealthy. Yeah, they mate. Have beautiful, amazing towns. They should have amazing towns. And, yeah. You know, right. tourism and things like this. I so agree. What have they got? They've got dirt. They've got big mounds of dirt. They're destroying, um, you know, tourism artifacts and, yep. you know, like the Burrett Peninsula. Yep. You know, I mean, how many of those, how many of those stone carvings have travelled overseas and people are, you know, buying them for millions of dollars, like the Mona Lisa and, yeah. you know, things like that. Can I, say, really can, can I say this to you, that our people yeah. don't understand that um, those stone carvings and, and the dendroglyphs on carved tre trees, etc., these things yeah. represent statute law. They're ritual statute yeah. law, yeah? And the reason these yeah. white fellas are taking them and destroying them is because they're destroying our library of statutory law, of the ritual statutory law that belongs to our law and culture. Yeah. Those, no, thing, no, those things, thing. those things lay down the law. When you get the old people and when you get ceremonial people, educated people, who can read those things, that's telling you our law. Yeah. That's telling you, and it comes from celestial law, which is the highest form of law there is in this world. No, it is. It's, yeah. it's, just, it's and, just amazing. And, and I, I tell young people. Can I add one one more thing on that? Yeah. Yep. You can add. Yeah. Yep. Well, Go that 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 thing there, when you're dealing with statutory law like that and ritual law, well, then the ritual law of the Cath of the churches come from those stone tablets, yeah, and all the etchings in it, and they 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 wrote it all down, okay, and other stuff that was written. Now that became what they call canon law. Now, if you look at the yep. legal system, canon law is religious law, same as ours. Yep. And in that system, we have, because we have ritual statute, statutory law here, ritual law, statutes, then that there becomes then spiritual law, and that is like canon law, and now they've got a system where only ecclesiastical courts can deal with that canon law, no common law courts are permitted to deal with religious law. And, and this is where Aboriginal people are missing the boat because that's what happens in this country, where the courts cannot deal with our law as the, under, under our law and culture because that is separated and that's where they say um, religion is separated from politics and it's separated from law and it's a law unto itself and no common law courts are able to deal with any canon law as it should not be able to deal with any of our native law. That's interesting you say that too, because I believe that. But it's also interesting too, at the moment, they're trying to 
put religion in, you know, recognise um, religion in, um, in, in, in the law there, where it's supposed to be a separation, as we know, separation of um, politics and, and religion, but they're still trying to push it. Well, they're not going to. They're not going to yeah. succeed oh. because the Christians are not going to let that happen, and the Muslims are not going to let that happen. Well, it'll be up to everyone, not just um, Christians, Muslims, and um, Buddhists. They've got so many different religions out there. So, when you want protection for religion, um, it has to be right across the board, not uh, just um, Christianity. That's why it'll never happen. Yeah, that, exactly, because it's all gone quiet again. Yes, it's and gone it, it's gone again. quiet. And the thing is, that us blackfellas. We sit down twiddling our thumbs, and only because not enough of us know our law and culture properly, that we don't know how to argue it. But I, but we have people now, that, and that's why I'm setting up these law councils around this country, where the old ones who have the law and culture and are ceremonially educated are the ones who dominate the and and make the decisions. Yeah, no, I, I just think it is because we do have a lot of people out there that know the law, but it's no one's listening to them because of. Um the Westminster system or the white man's way of doing things and yeah. they've been brainwashed so I can't wait I can't wait Michael well, thank All you right, very mate. much good on you it. thank you thank you Kay. and that was Michael Anderson there from the Sovereign Union of First Nations uh, First Nations and Peoples in Australia here you can uh, find out more from sovereignunion.mobi and you're listening to Black Chat here coming to you live and deadly on 93.7 FM